Is oh, got it. <laughs> so one thing that I want to highlight in terms of new features is uh, there's there are new versions of the parallel four functions that operate on the multifab level rather than operating on single boxes. So instead of writing an MF iter loop and then inside that doing parallel four and then uh, specifying the bounds of the box, you would pass in a whole multifab and then each rank can figure out what data points it owns and launch just one kernel operating over all those points. And this can significantly reduce kernel launch overhead in the case of small box sizes. And small doesn't necessarily have to even be that small here. I think this effect can be significant at like 64 cubed, for example. Um, this, the new forms of this function are used in many places internally in AMRX. Uh, in the linear solvers for error tagging and a lot of the multifab functions and utilities. And I think they could be useful in the apps as well. I um, also want to point out that this is particularly important for HIP and PC++ because I, I don't, and I don't under know if this is like a software or hardware issue, but we have noticed that the NVIDIA systems tend to be a bit better, or they tend to have a bit lower kernel launch overhead. So this is kind of more of an issue on on the, on the other platforms. And finally, so we don't have particle container level functions like this as well, but that's something that's on our roadmap for people to use as well. Um, another thing that's new is the expression parser. So this is, a, this is an example of something that was originally developed for one of the projects, but now has been migrated into AMRX and that, because it could be more broadly useful. Um, but what this is, is like, say you want to specify a specific initial plasma density profile as a function of X, Y, Z, but you don't want to, every time you change that, you don't want to have to write a new C++ function and recompile the code. Um, what this lets you do is specify a math expression as like a, like a string, and then you could put that string in your inputs file and then as the code is running, this parser will compile that expression and then it can be evaluated in both host and device code. Um, and yeah, we found this to be really useful in WarpX and we think it could be more generally useful as well. Um, and it supports a wide range of math functions. There's like trig functions, exponentials, uh, the heavy side step function. Vessel functions of the first kind. I, I think WarpX does stuff in RZ is why that was needed. But um, yeah, so essentially, if you think this could be useful in your project, WeChain could probably extend this to do other kinds of operations as well that you need. Um, there's also some new stuff in EB land that I wanted to highlight. So originally, the EB support in AMRX was. Uh, limited to you had to specify the geometry in terms of analytic implicit functions so you could say give me a cylinder or give me the cylinder and the sphere for example um but it's difficult to scale that up to to representing really complex geometries um so recently support has been added for doing general triangle message message that's oh, right <laughs> mesh is and it will sort of take that list of triangles and compute all the area fractions and volume fractions and normals and stuff that are needed to, to represent the EB. Um, this was originally developed by Hari for the, for the Pele suite of codes, um, but it's now been integrated into AMRX's EB infrastructure. Um, and I think that is another example of something that was developed for one code, but could be useful for others, because I think WarpX has plans of using this now as well. Uh, in addition to that, there's been a number of small cell bug fixes. That's always a problem with like the cut cell representation. Um, improved linear so solver support. So there's now a node-centered EB-aware linear solver. And we've also had improved uh, single precision support with EB. Um, a few new things in particle land. So one of them is we have particle container level tuple reductions now. So, so what that means is um, say you want to, over all the particles in a container, you want to compute 
the extrema of the positions. So you want to compute the min and max of in 3D X, Y, and Z. So rather than having to launch six different reduction operations, you can launch one reduction operation that does all those things in one pass. Um, and I think it, it doesn't literally just want launch one kernel, but it, you don't have to call the reduce function multiple times. So that can be significantly more efficient. Um, another thing that's been added in the past year or so is GPU support for ghost and virtual particles. Um, these particles are used when you have subcycling in the context of mesh refinement. So like in the Nix and in the Pele code. Um, and yeah, so this stuff is all, all happens on the GPU now. Um, I don't know if Landon is at this session, but I want to mention that he's also made a number of improvements to the ghost and virtual particle support in AMRX as well. Um, another thing that we've done is we've extended the ID range for the particles. So the way we assign unique IDs to particles is um, we don't want to have to do any communication to do that. So we give them both a CPU number, which is the rank that generated them, and an ID number, which is the unique ID on that rank for that particle. And then those numbers are kept persistent. So originally, we devoted uh, you know, one int to each of those numbers. But that's not the most efficient way to do that, because you're really never going to have 4 billion MPI ranks. Um, they need to be specified uniquely. So now we use like a bit packing thing to let you represent up to two to the 39 minus one IDs on two to the 24 minus one MPI ranks. Um, also, uh, Hinji, I don't know if he's at this session as well, but he implemented something that reduces the volume of ghost particle communication, um, which can speed up that operation significantly. And we've made various memory usage optimizations to sort of support running in a mode where the particles are really almost filling up the GPU memory. <clears throat> so finally, just like a just a sort of collection of other new things. So I, I guess I've mentioned EB single precision already, but there's been a number of improved support for mixed single precision things. So the ability to do a fill boundary operation and reduce precision, if that's okay for your algorithm, uh, can cut down the communication costs. Man managed memory has been made completely optional. Um, I'll talk about this more when we get to known issues, but uh, there were a few places in like the particle code where we were still relying on it. That's now all been removed. So this is a completely optional feature now. We've improved GPU support for tagging and regrading operations. Uh, we've improved HIP and DPC++ in general. And then finally, there have been a number of improvements in terms of the integrations between AMRX and other software packages. So Don Wilcox developed a, an AMRX time integrator class. So the applications won't need to re-implement like a basic, uh, you know, a basic run to cut a method or forward Euler over and over again. They can go through this class. And additionally, this wraps Sundial's time integrators to you. So if you compile with Sundial support, you can use like the multi-rate time integrators in there or their set of, of Runga kind of methods as well. Um, there's been improvement on the HDF5 support. Uh, support for asynchronous writes was added. Support for compression was added. That work is mostly done by Hu Jun Tang, who's an engineer at LBL. And, and finally improved in situ support using packages like Ascent and Sensei. And finally, I also want to highlight there's some new apps. And this is just, these are just the first few that I thought of from my limited perspective. So I'm not trying to slide any here, but uh, there's the IRF code, which is related to the AMR Wind project. It does kind of larger scale weather modeling. There's a number of biological cell modeling efforts that have been spun up in the last year. And there's a new particle accelerator modeling code that's spun up called ImpactX. So that said, so I want to give an overview of the current status of HIP and DPC++ support. So we think that basically all AMRX functionality uh, is, is working with all three backends, CUDA, HIP, DPC++. That includes sort of all the things that I've listed here. Um, we have a test suite that includes all these operations. And modulo a few 
reported what we think are compiler bugs on specific systems, uh, we believe that that's all, all working. Um, and AMRX developers work with AMD and Intel engineers uh, regularly to sort of file bugs and address performance issues. Now I want to get into some crusher performance data. Um, so this is a suite of micro benchmarks that we have that compares sort of single kernel operations. And this is showing between A100 and an MI250X using only one of the dies on the MI250X. And it's been normalized to A100. So the A100 number on this is always one, but you can sort of see how the MI250X compares to that. Um, this is looking at a bunch of various things. So the DAXP operation is in the memory bound limit. Uh, this operation is in the compute bound limit. Branch is very similar to the compute bound one, but it allows for just different threads to be doing different things. Um, reduce max are both parallel reduction operations. Scan is a parallel prefix sum, um, and so on. One thing I particularly wanted to highlight is so the Jacobi, Jacobi Sync, Jacobi Elixir, and Jacobi Memory Pool. Um, so the Sync, Elixir, and Memory Pool are all different methods for handling temporary scratch space. So Sync is just like explicitly syncing, for example. Elixir is using callback functions. Memory Pool is using, in the case of CUDA, it's using an async arena. Um, the MI250X performance lags on these, and it's due to the launch, it's due mostly to the launch latency thing I was talking about. The Jacobi one itself is using that uh, multi fab level parallel four operation to fuse everything together into one kernel launch. And you can see in that case, we're getting about the same performance between MI250X and A100. So that, that's, that's a significant thing. Um, this is a benchmark comparing for particle mesh operations and double precision. So we're looking at both, we're breaking it down in terms of deposition, gathering, and then like the total runtime. And essentially what we're finding is that a single die of MI250X compares well against A100. It does slightly better on deposit than it does on gather. Um, and then we've also seen, so we also show on here the result of using both the dies on the 250X. And essentially we, we saw a big improvement on this benchmarking going from the MI100 to the MI200 is another point I wanna make. Um, this is a similar, this is a particle redistribution benchmark. So this is, having six GPUs and moving particles around randomly and then migrating the particles to the right GPU basically. And I've broken down this operation into the communication is the green, the packing and unpacking time, and then the partition time. And you can see that on Summit, Crusher, and then the A100s, the com and packing times are basically the same, but this partition is kind of driving the difference between them all. So this is something where we're still seeing that the MI250X kind of lags behind the A100 is on this partition part of the redistribute operation. So that's something that we're looking into. Um, this is linear solver performance. Um, so we again see here that the MI250X is, does better than the Summit GPUs and it does better than the Spock GPUs, but it lags a bit behind A100. And that's kind of a general pattern that we've seen here. So we're getting kind of better results on pressure than we got on Summit, but we're still not achieving the same performance as the A100. Um, I want to mention a few known issues that we've had on pressure anyway. So we've noticed that the MPI is not particularly stable and especially after they make certain updates. So there have been times when we've been able to run on you know, most of the crusher nodes. And then there's times when we can't do that. And this makes doing scaling analyses difficult. Um, another thing we've noticed is that having managed memory turned on, um, even if the data is not actually touched on the CPU, but just if you allocate managed memory, it really takes performance. So we actually just changed this 
and then had to revert that change because I was updating performance data for this presentation. And it was suddenly like two orders of magnitude lower. <laughs> so we had to revert that change and just not never allocate managed memory on, on pressure. And as I mentioned before, so the performance of some key kernels, so the linear solvers, redistribute partition seems to lag behind A100. And we think that this is due to an increased tendency to register spell in the HIP compiler. Um, and now I'd like to kick it over to Eric. Eric, do you want to reshare your slides? Because I might have made some, I think the formatting got a little screwed up in the copy paste. Sure, I'll stop sharing my screen. And okay, I'll go ahead and share mine now. Does that look okay? Yeah, you're yeah. a little low volume. Oh, how about I get a little bit closer? Is that better? Speak loudly. Speak loudly. How about now? Uh, that's better, but keep it uh, up. Let me let me see what's going on here. If I can just turn it up quickly. I don't know how. Okay. Well, I'll just, sorry. <laughs> I'll just get closer to the mic like this. Is that okay? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, my name is Eric, and I'm the newest member of the uh, newest M en engineer with the AMRX team. So today I'm going to briefly describe uh, several features of the AMRX software ecosystem. So AMRX has multiple software integrations and is part of several software stacks. AMRX integrates with mathematical packages such as Hyper, Petsy, and Sundials, and tools such as Alpine and HDF5. For example, application codes like Castro, which does astrophysics, and Pele, which does combustion, use Sundials to compute chemical reaction networks. In addition to our own native solvers, we also integrate with Hyper and Petsy to do linear solves on mesh data. Moreover, we have example codes demonstrating the Sundials time integrator and Hyper and Petsy linear solver tie-in functionality. Amorex is also part of the extreme scale scientific software stack E4S and is available via SPAC, a package manager for supercomputers. Amorex can be installed via SPAC and recently we enabled a built-in SPAC smoke test that tests the install. Moreover, the smoke test is also capable of testing variations that include CUDA and AMD HIP GPU backends. A number of visualization tools support AMRX grid and particle data. Starting at top left and going around the circle, we have first AMRViz, our natively developed tool. Second, we have Paraview, showing a 3D animation of particle data. Third, we have a plot done in Visit, showing the adaptive mesh refinement boxes. And fourth, we have a composite image made using plots with the Python package YT. AMRX also optionally integrates with HDF5 for output. Both AMRX's native format and HDF5 output have the ability to perform asynchronous writes, but HDF5 can additionally provide SZ and ZFP compression. We also strive to provide excellent documentation. So to do this, we split our documentation into four modes to target specific users and uses. The four modes are a user's guide, technical reference, guided tutorials, and example codes. The user guide provides general knowledge about how to use our software. Our technical reference is generated automatically via Doxygen, and the goal is to provide deep and specific knowledge in an easily searchable format. Example codes provide an accelerated first step towards developing custom apps for experienced developers. Guided tutorials, on the other hand, focus on teaching specific knowledge without getting bogged down by details. With this arrangement, we believe the additional focus of our documentation maximizes the usefulness for our developers and users. Uh, finally, to provide excellent quality software, AMRX tests regularly and often. As part of our open source development via GitHub, we enable continuous integration tests. These tests compile code changes on pull requests and merges for a variety of compilers, platforms, and accelerator backends. This includes Linux, Mac OS, Windows platforms, GCC, NVC, Clang, MSVC compilers, and CUDA, HIP, and Intel backends. We also have our own in-house regression suite for nightly regression testing. These tests compare results and performance to benchmark data and send emails when performance is degraded or, comparison goes, or comparisons go outside data tolerances. 
Third, we provide testing scripts for Build Test NERSC. Build Test is a testing framework currently being used by NERSC to test deployment of the E4S software stack as a module on its systems. AMRX contributes scripts that test compilation and execution for its part in this module. Um, so this concludes sort of my brief interview of some of the features of the AMRX software ecosystem. I hope in this brief time, I've uh, somewhat convinced you that we are taking a comprehensive approach to making AMRX as effective for you and your applications as possible. So um, thanks for your time and I'll send it back to you, Andrew. All right, thank you. Um, I'm trying to go through the chat for questions here. So I believe one was about how was the in-situ support for Ascent improved? So I know that there were a number of bug fixes related specifically to visualizing particles with Ascent that were merged over the past years. And I think that was what I was referring to in the slide. Um, do we have any other questions for right now? Okay. If not, I believe next up is uh, Mike Zingale talking about Castro. Yep. All right. Uh, let me share. Can you see? Yep, looks good. Yep. Two years into the pandemic and we still ask every time we share a screen, can you see it? I know. Uh, all right, this is my last week of classes, so I'm enthusiastic now. I can finally get to do uh, some more code stuff. I'll talk about some of the work we've been doing uh, with Castro to get us ready for the next generation machines with, uh, with the whole usual cast of characters here, uh, helping out and contributing to the work that I'll show. So with Castro, we seek to model uh, reactive astrophysical flows, in particular exploding stars. And um, we focus on a couple of these environments that are near and dear to our heart, but they all have the same, uh, same character. There's often some convective burning that precedes the, the explosion. Uh, gravity is important, radiation can be important, uh, and the coupling of hydrodynamics and reactions is critically important. And, uh, and there's a huge range of time scales. The reactions are very stiff. The hydrodynamics we like to treat um, explicitly. So we walk along at the um, sound speed limited current, current time. Uh, the problem that we've been focusing on a lot lately is the problem of X-ray bursts. These are brief flashes of X-rays that we see uh, with X-ray satellites in our, in our galaxy. There's um, there's about 70 or so known sources of these. You see a flash of x-rays and that lasts about a second or maybe 10 seconds, then an hour or a few hours or a day later, you see another one. And these things can go off regularly. And the model for this is that you build up a layer of fuel, hydrogen and helium, and then you thermonuclear detonate, uh, well, not detonate, you thermonuclear burn that fuel in a time scale of a second or so, and it's very hot, on the order of 10 million Kelvin or so, so it shines in the x-rays, and we can see that. Uh, and you only need to build up five meters of fuel for the base to get to densities of a million grams per cubic centimeter and temperatures of 100 million Kelvin or so, uh, hot enough and dense enough to fuse helium into carbon and, and all sorts of fun heavy nuclei. So we want to model this, and we've been trying for, for a while to model this. This is some 2D stuff I'm showing here, and we have 3D stuff that we've run recently. But the big um, thing that's helped us is that when we moved Castro from uh, working on the CPU to the GPU, we got more than a factor of 10 in performance, probably more like a factor of 20 now gains on a single node of, uh, of Summit. And that allowed us to relax a lot of the approximations that we were previously using to make the problem feasible and allows us to do more realistic um, simulations. And so our, our, our hope is to build up to do more and more of this neutron star to allow us to model a propagating burning front, burning through a helium layer or hydrogen helium layer 
uh, spreading across the surface of this neutron star to understand the nucleosynthesis, understand how fast these reactions uh, take place and try to understand what these things will look like for us. Um, so we benefited a lot early on from the, the GPU hackathons that, that uh, places like OLCF organized. And our first approach when we first started doing this was to leverage managed memory and basically have it deal with everything for us when the data is needed. We just manage memory, we just make it work. And uh, this allowed us to migrate the kernels in our code piece by piece to, to the GPU. Um, and it allowed us to do it with very minimal kernel rewrites. There's, there's some basic things that you had to do, but that made it work better on the CPU as well. So it's, it was sort of a win-win. When we first started doing this, all of our compute kernels were in Fortran and sort of the outer um, memory management parallelism, all that stuff provided by AMRX was in C++. And so we had to sort of uh, find a way to launch Fortran kernels from, uh, from C++, but uh, allow us to reuse our same kernels. And, and we had written this Python preprocessor that, that would uh, detect this Pragma GPU that we created and at compile time, it would write the boilerplate code to handle the offloading and, and mapping of each zone to a CUDA core and, and, and do all that. It worked well, but it was kind of fragile, mixed language uh, with C++ and, and Fortran. And having to write this Python preprocessor to handle things, uh, it's just not a very efficient way to do things. It wasn't really a great way uh, to spend our time. It also uh, required us to share more information and take up more registers, which meant that we weren't getting the performance that, that we thought we could out of the GPUs. So we started porting to C++ and taking advantage of the AMRX GPU launch mechanism, uh, the Lambda capture stuff. And again, we were able to do this piece by piece. And it's kind of fun. This is a graph that shows uh, C++ um, starting in January of 2019, and now in uh, April of this year. And this was a holiday break when I didn't have to teach and we could just go crazy and, and convert things. And you can see we're basically, we're effectively all C++. The, the few bits of code that are still in Fortran, we actually don't use. And uh, when we compile now, we compile C++ only. And this really allowed us to take advantage of all the, um, all of the new data structures and launch mechanisms that, uh, that AMRX provided for us. So uh, in addition to porting the code, uh, Castro, we also had to port our, our microphysics. And in particular, in reactive flows, the reactions are the most time consuming part of our advance, at least for this, for this x-ray burst. It can be 80% you know, of the runtime is spent in reactions. Uh, we use Vode, which if you've ever looked at Vode, it's this nice 1960s style Fortran um, uh, integrator that has lots of computed go-tos and stuff that will make you scream in, in horror. And uh, we, we ported it to C++. We despaghettified it, got rid of 200 plus go-tos, uh, converted it completely to a hetero library, and uh, added some additional logic that, that knows about uh, reaction networks. And it actually works quite efficiently for us. We do the entire integration all on the GPU with this. Something that, that we've done recently as well is since we're now all into C++, we've switched the right-hand side of our reaction network to be completely uh, C++ templated. So no longer do we actually have to write y dot equals you know, a creation term from this reaction, a destruction term from this reaction, and all that. Instead, we write a few lines of metadata that basically says, this is the reaction, this is the species that are consumed, this is the species that are created. And the compiler builds the entire right-hand side, it builds the entire Y dot uh, just using C++ template functions at compile time. And this greatly simplifies the maintenance, but it also gives us an ability to do lots of optimizations. And in particular, the compiler now knows the sparsity of the linear system that it needs to solve because it knows for every, uh, every uh, species, it knows exactly which reactions contribute, which uh, are, are invoked 
and which species they involve. And that means that we can have the C++ templates also write out the linear algebra for us that gets rid of any unneeded multiplications. And this gave us a nice efficiency boost as well. Uh, and finally, we have this Python project that, that we really like that directly outputs the C++ code for us. A few lines of Python says, I want to burn uh, helium into carbon and oxygen. And it downloads the rates from the nuclear reaction community, uh, nuclear experimental community, and, uh, and basically writes out all the C++ code for us to use. So all this has sort of helped us a lot. This is a plot that shows how we do on Summit for a 3D X-ray burst. The blue points are from 2020. The orange points are from 2021. And the green points are from last week. And uh, this is the same problem. And so as you see with time, we've sped up a lot. Um, and this is because of the reaction network templating. It's also because of ongoing memory optimizations. And it's also because of a feature that, um, that Max Katz, who, who still worked with us, uh, added last week, that basically um, it turns out that in our hydrodynamics update, we create a lot of temporary data because we need fluxes at all sorts of different uh, uh, centerings to, to do the sort of update we're doing. And so all that temporary data eats up a lot of GPU memory. But now we have a way to dynamically at runtime determine the optimal size of the tile that we're going to uh, loop over and put on the GPU by counting out how much um, temporary memory is created the first pass through the hydrodynamics. And then it dynamically adjusts that tile size so that the next time through, we don't oversubscribe the, the GPU. And this allows us to run um, more efficiently on small core counts where oversubscribing the memory was, uh, was a risk. And that's probably what happened with the change at these lowest uh, core counts where we're now a factor of two or so faster just in the past, past year. And this is something, this is an example of uh, a piece of code that we've already been talking with, with Gene to, to translate over to Nick. So it's one of these ideas that we can easily share between application codes. Um, so we played with Frontier, uh, with Crusher, a bit. Um, we required two changes in order to get us working on, on Frontier. One, uh, Crusher, it keeps in Frontier. Uh, one was that uh, the compilers there didn't, don't support C17 inline data. We had switched that just because it's nicer. So we had to unswitch to that so that we could compile. Maybe they support it now, but at the time they didn't have full C17 support. Um, and the other thing is there was one variable deep in the reaction stuff that even though it was never used before it was initialized, the, the HIP compilers wanted it to be initialized. It's probably a compiler bug, but uh, those two things changed and, and we just worked uh, without any other changes on, on Crusher. This is looking at a 3D Sadoff problem, so a point explosion. There's a, a coarse grid plus three levels of refinement, a lot of um, regridding a lot of dynamic, uh, you know, the, the point is growing in size. And so it's a very hard problem for, for load balancing. And this is going from uh, one node to six, 16 nodes. No, yeah, one node to 16 nodes on, um, let's see, Crusher is blue, Perlmutter is green, and Summit is orange. And this is strong scaling. We scale pretty well, you know, uh, out to a factor of eight, fall off because now that we're getting really work starved here, we seem to scale better on Crusher than Summit, maybe because their network is faster. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but we do pretty well on all of those. Um, for, for this problem, this is too big to run on Crusher. Uh, the minimum number of nodes we need on Summit is, uh, is 250. We can't do this on uh, uh, 256, we can't do that in Crusher. So I tried to do a much smaller problem. I did this on Monday and it's not at all load balanced. Uh, the burning's all in one small region. And so a lot, and since the burning dominates, a lot of stuff isn't doing anything. It's only one level. Uh, so it's coarser than we would actually run and it's a smaller domain, but we work. We run on Crusher out to 64 nodes uh, and it seems to work pretty well for us. 
and uh, and this suggests that we should be, you know, we'll, I've spent exactly uh, half a day on this, that we should be able to get our performance in line when, uh, when Frontier comes. Uh, so, so that's sort of where we are. Uh, Castro runs pretty well on NVIDIA and AMD GPUs using basically all the backend stuff that AMRx does, abandoning our own custom Python preprocessor to, to write those functions really allowed us to, to focus more on the science and take advantage of all the offloading stuff uh, in AMRx. We don't have any access to the Intel machines. Uh, even if we did, I guess we wouldn't be allowed to show them. So I have no clue what we would do on an Intel machine, but I imagine we'd be able to, to run there with minimal changes. Uh, and if we ever do get access, we could test that out. Um, we've been doing a lot of optimizations, particularly to memory uh, usage in Castro to allow us to run more efficiently on smaller node counts, just because those get through the queue faster. And, and it's paid off really well, especially this dynamic uh, adjustment of the hydro tile size. That's, that's new of, as of last week. And it's something we'll play around with some more uh, in the coming months, just to sort of further tune. Uh, finally, all of our stuff is out in, uh, up on GitHub, out in the open. All of our development is there. You can see it in real time as we break the code and all of the science problems that we run are out and in that open repo as well. And I probably went fast, but I think I think I might have ended more or less on time. I'm not sure. So I'll stop there. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so I assume we did have a question from Axel in the chat about templating and compile times. So you wanna you wanna ask your question, Axel? Yeah, yeah, first of all, great work. Uh, I also like the over time thing. I remember we had, had a similar situation uh, two years ago. The, I was wondering, the, you say you pulled a lot of things to header only and uh, templated heavily. Are you trying to contain these templates to specific translation units? Because I, I have the experience, I had extreme code where I had to put everything into one translation unit at some point. Um, and then combination for like just changing a few lines gets really up. Yeah, we, um, we, we had that problem too. So I didn't say it. one of the one of the reasons why we also like the move to C is because we can do this inlining a lot better. When when we were doing Fortran, one of the things that we did is we had this make target called Mega Fortran, and what it would do is it would topologically sort all the Fortran and concatenate them all into a one big Fortran file, and then the compiler would cry trying to trying to build that just to get that. So yeah, there is some some trade off on on how big you have to do, but you know if if we're running for months and it takes an hour to compile, I can you know I can live with that. Uh, yeah, but it I, doesn't. Um, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's my question basically. Because I I argued the same way for many years, but uh, users told me otherwise at some point. So I was like, but the payoff of the biggest difference. performance, you know, the stuff we run takes a long time to run. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't take an hour to compile. Maybe it takes yeah. 10 minutes or on Crusher actually, maybe it takes five minutes to compile. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, yeah no, for the, a I while, think there was one thing that was causing a lot of pain for the compilers, but uh, but I don't, that hasn't been a problem lately. So I think the compilers have gotten better as well. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'm also actively like wondering how to do this, right? So my current approach is to try to specialize in the virtual CPP files when I can, so that I don't include everything everywhere. Yeah, uh, and that is probably a good trade-off of having all the performance benefits, the maintainability, but not having a single CPP file that takes five minutes. Yeah, so for instance, for us, uh, we inlined most of the microphysics, so the equation of state, which is actually, yeah. you know, for stellar equation of states, kind of a decent amount of work, um, and within the reaction, so the reaction, the integrator is a C++ file, but the well, the, the, the wrapper is, but then vote itself is headers and all of the right-hand side is headers and all that. So all of that gets all inlined and then we call that from a C++. Mm. And it works well. Nice. Cool. Thanks so much for presenting this. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, any more questions for Mike? I guess I have one. I don't know if this is maybe more appropriate for like the discussion at the end, but so, so it sounds like you've made a number of optimizations to the reaction networks. Yeah. Uh, to what extent do you think those are also appropriate to look at for Pele or Nix? I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I think if we didn't have the pandemic interfering things, I would have been coming out more often. We could have had those conversations in, in person and I could have collected my mug. Um, but uh, I don't know. Um, we all sort of went our own path on that, I think. And so it would be good to sort of uh, reconvene and figure that out. Don's probably the one who has the most familiarity with all the separate ways of, that people are doing things. So it would be a good conversation to have. Okay. Cool. Uh, I know at one point they tried to use sundials with our stuff, but it was just too slow. And maybe that's changed. Um, yeah, it, it's something worth revisiting. Okay, interesting. Um, the other thing is, so, so you were able to run on 64 pressure nodes on Monday. <laughs> is that what you said? I, I was able to run on 96 only because Jean shared with me her super secret exclude list of nodes. Yeah, and yeah. Jean would be a trial and error. I don't know how she did this. Figured out which nodes don't work on Crusher. And, it, and I had to manually exclude them all. And then I could run on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think I got something on 128 as well. But it... Um, no, no, but that crashed. Yeah, no, that that had no issues. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't having much luck earlier this week, but yeah, maybe it's I don't know what. Maybe I'm using a different different modules loaded, different environment. I don't know. All I know I is talk know. to Gene and magic happens. Um, but the, <laughs> um, you know, I is my last week of teaching. I haven't had much time to play with it all semester, so I just had to get something. And thankfully, I managed to push that through. Yeah. I think I just heard Gene. Hey, Gene's on here. We on there, Gene? I, I mean, so, so, so no. So, so to be to be fair, some of the initial suggestions of which nodes we might want to avoid came from Andrew and Lucas. Also contributed some suggested nodes to avoid. Okay. Um, but yeah, in my talk, I also have more than a small number of nodes. Yeah. Oh. Or, Mike, quick question. Have you tried out the new Parallel 4? The, the one that we have not, out? no. OK. Yeah, I'm thinking that might be another good topic for discussion at the end is, are there other, yeah, like where are some places where we could try to use that? Yeah, Gene, Gene brought that up to us last week or this week. I don't know. I don't even know what day it is anymore. But yeah, yeah, that's something to think about over the summer. OK. Uh, any more questions for, for Mike? Okay, if not, we'll, we'll thank you again for that. And yeah. um, next up is Akash. Hello everyone. Thanks, Andrew. Yep. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for attending um, this session. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we have been doing at Argon on scaling AMRX using a bit tree framework. And the, uh, this is a collaborated work. So, Rachel and Anne have been uh, 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 advising us on this front as well. Uh, and Tom, who has, been, uh, who has been working very closely with me, and some of the simulations that I'll show uh, are mostly done by him. Um, Okay, so let's talk about FlashX. Um, FlashX is a multi-physics application code uh, that uses two separate uh, techniques for uh, grid management. The first one is Paramesh, which has been uh, natively developed now within FlashX, uh, specific for some of the configurations. And for Exastar, we integrated AMRX as an additional grid package. And AMRX is, of course, a separate standalone library um, that uh, has been designed to mimic opti, opti behavior for FlashX. Uh, 
so what, what what is the motivation for this project why we want to look at amr efficiency because we have uh, a separate grid package available that we have worked on for over years uh, we did some initial uh, performance tests when we started integrating amrx with flashx um, and this was before i started working and we and we noticed that um, well for com direct one to one comparison between castro and flashx revealed that uh, scaling, uh, there were scaling limitations at higher MPI ranks for Castro. Uh, and that led us to investigate deeper into why it may be happening. Um, and, and, and then in separate tests that I performed when I was working with FlashX, I found that the Poisson solver with AMRX is significantly better. So we have this situation where uh, with Paramesh, we have some eff efficiency in parallel scaling, but then AMRX provides really better performance with some of the important components of the code, for example, like Poisson Solver, which is important for uh, Exastar applications. So what I decided was to design more structured tests that can test all of these components in a, in, uh, in a separate environment, uh, not in a separate environment, but uh, uh, as, a, as a separate test cases. And I use some of my work that I did in my PhD with level set reduction and multi-phase flows to uh, come up with some unique tests, uh, which I'll show you uh, in the next few slides. So the first test that I looked at was Poisson, uh, Poisson equation. Um, and in this case, we define uh, an exact solution of let's say a variable P given by uh, a combination of uh, products of sign in X, Y, and Z direction. And here's a computational domain you can see. And each node, each, each number here, coordinate represents an uh, individual node. So let's say if you want to do weak scaling, you just extend the nodes either in Z, X or Y direction, and you can uh, extend the solution and, um, uh, and uh, increase the load on your computational problem. And the cross section you see here is the corresponding AMR grid that we use to refine in the region of interest. Uh, we performed this test uh, using our FlashX native uh, implementation with Hyper and against AMRX's multigrid. And you can see for both of them, we fairly capture second order accuracy very well. So both of them are computing um, uh, accurate solutions. Uh, but on the other side, you see the performance and you see that the multigrid AMRX performs an order of magnitude faster in comparison to Hyper. So this is really a big selling point of using AMRX. Uh, for our multi-physics applications. Uh, but then when I look at the second point, which is of level set advection, and in this domain, you have, you, you put bubbles, uh, uh, at, at, uh, in, you, know, you see a bubble at an initial location, and the bubbles are defined by a level set function, uh, which is essentially a distance function, but it is positive inside the bubble and negative in, uh, outside. And we prescribe a advection velocity. So when we run the simulation, you see on the right here, uh, the bubble deforms uh, due to the prescribed velocity field. And along with advection, we do redistancing because since uh, uh, this bubble uh, needs to have sharp interface, um, if you were to just uh, do advection, you would probably, uh, I mean, we have done some studies in the past where if you just do advection, you introduce diffusion, which shrinks the si which shrinks the size of the bubble. So you need to do some additional redistancing subiterations that you let me turn on my laser pointer here. Um, so we have to do additional redistancing subiterations to preserve the volume of the bubble, and that involves a lot of additional guard cell filling and computations. Um, so th this was a good problem to test uh, other capabilities, uh, uh, other other components between Paramesh and AMRX. Uh, without using the Poisson solver. So Poisson solver showed us very good performance. So we looked at different components. And over here on the cross section, you see the corresponding uh, octree grid that uh, we use. And again, for this test problem, if you increase the number of nodes in Z direction, you add more bubbles so you can scale your problem uh, that way. Okay, so here is one-to-one -one comparison of the AMRX and Paramesh grid. And you can see that uh, the grid uh, refinement is very similar between the two. Um, but if you look at the performance, you see that uh, for guard cell filling, AMRX performs uh, not as good uh, compared to Paramesh. Even the scaling for Paramesh in both uh, update refinement for Paramesh is, takes more time than AMRX. But if you look at the scaling behavior, you see that Paramesh scales very well 
uh, versus AMRX, uh, which uh, which has some uh, uh, which has some uh, performance intriguing performance curve. Okay, so why do we suspect that this happens? Um, so uh, let's look at how AMRX does patch based refinement. Um, uh, AMRX is a very flexible library. So uh, if you want to refine your grid around features, um, you can create patches uh, around that uh, specific area, but the patches are not constrained. So they can, the size of the patches is not constrained. The way the relationship between different patches exist is not, uh, um, uh, it's not um, defined uh, in a very unique way. For example, let's say if you have a child block, Right, that child block can have multiple parents, as you see here, at two different refinement levels. So every time you want to communicate and access information between parent and child, you have to perform linear searches, which adds to the uh, overhead that we saw in the previous slide. Um, in Paramesh, uh, which is uh, which is an aux tree based refinement, we have a more constrained and structured refinement pattern. Right. So on the left, you see this computational grid that is refining around a feature. Uh, but the refinement is very uh, uh, it's, it's very methodical in the sense that you start with a coarser grid, which is and you see the blocks on the right side. So you start with a coarser grid, you arrange that grid in a space as a in a space filling curve at, at the coarsest refinement level, and then you keep successively refining and you keep arranging the blocks in that pattern until you uh, refine at your area of interest, right? And what this leads to is a, a very unique relationship between parent and child blocks where you have a child block uh, number eight that you see here uh, correspondingly over here has a unique parent. So every child has a unique parent. So that relationship is defined and we can condense this relationship into, an, into a tree data structure uh, that, that can uh, be used to access information more quickly and avoid the linear search that we uh, do with batch based refinement. So, and along with, um, so this, this differences in metadata management um, for AMRX that doesn't have a unique parent child relationship and Paramesh, which uses a tree data structure, that uh, uh, is uh, something that can, uh, that determines the performance that we saw before. Um, so uh, we, we, um, we essentially want to replicate what we do with Paramesh, the optimizations we do with Paramesh natively within AMRX so we can scale AMRX better because if we can do that, then it is a full a well rounded library that can be used for multiple applications and particularly for applications that don't require a flexible grid and they can do away with constrained grid refinement. Um, in that spirit, uh, we have been working with uh, a separate um, library called Bitree. Uh, we developed Bitree uh, natively for FlashX initially uh, that can replicate Paramesh's tree data structure in a, in a, in a more uh, less, um, in a more memory efficient way. Uh, and we use this Bitree for different applications within uh, different units within FlashX. So let's look at what Bitree does, right? So over here, we looked at this uh, block, uh, this Opti data grid, few slides before and it's over here again. Uh, we represent this octree grid in a tree data structure and then we just convert it into a bitmap where zeros represents the leaf block and one represents um, uh, the parent blocks. A and this uh, bitmap is organized level by level. So internally bit tree can identify what level a parent and a child belong to. And uh, and this was, in a, this was developed by John Bashan in Flash and uh, now we are trying to extend it to AMRX. So that's, that, that is the thesis of this project. Can we do this within AMRX and will, uh, will it uh, efficiently improve AMRX's performance, right? Um, to do that, we started first with how Bitree is within uh, FlashX. So what happens is when FlashX, uh, FlashX uh, works with Paramesh to do regridding, uh, Paramesh directly interfaces with the Bitree Fortran C API within FlashX to uh, transfer the uh, to create the bitmap that FlashX units can use to access the grid information. Um, in that spirit, we initially started with uh, doing the same thing, right? So we send regrid requests to AMRX, then uh, there is a callback from AMRX to Bitree within FlashX 
that creates the bitmap and provides it to AMRX. And this was done to initially verify if we can do this, can AMRX read uh, BitTree? Uh, and then we decided that a better way would be to natively uh, have BitTree communicate with AMRX. And for, uh, to do that, we converted our BitTree Fortran C API into a C++ interface, uh, which is hosted in a separate repository. Uh, and the tag is over here. And now we have managed to access uh, and uh, that uh, access the library within AMRX. So this is our fork of AMRX. Uh, it is a public repository, so you guys can take a look at it. And what we have essentially done is we have introduced a BitTree class. So there is a separate uh, AMRX underscore BitTree uh, implementation that has a BT unit class. And uh, we use that now to uh, create bit trees, uh, bit tree within AMRX. So what is the current state of things? Um, at present, we can uh, create bit tree in AMRX, but the next challenge is uh, leveraging this bit tree. So now we have this information that is uh, present on every node in AMRX in a very memory efficient way. Now we need to go in and look at each individual component, for example, a fill patch routine or regrading routines uh, where we can uh, avoid uh, using a linear search and just query the bit tree to get the information. Uh, and that, that would require some more engineering on AMRX side uh, and closely working with the AMRX team. And once we are able to do this, um, not only FlashX, but other applications can also use um, uh, this uh, bit tree framework to accelerate their code. Um, with that, I think uh, I'll take some questions. I hope I was able to uh, Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Akash right now? Uh, Akash, this is Anne. I know what we had talked about. Um, it, it, it's not an all or nothing. You can you can migrate functionality. Are you thinking the first one would be the go self fill? Is that I can't remember what the, the path forward was. Yeah, I think we are going to start with um, guard cell filling. I think that is something that that it would be uh, because we already have a test problem that we can start testing with. So I think that would be the way to go. OK. Yeah. And then I was curious in your in your early, I think it was your first or second slide, Paramesh took a lot of time to, I think it was update regridding is what you wrote. What was yes. that about? Um, so that is something that. Um, we are uh, trying to um, look into. Uh, we suspect that there might be something happening during the grid filling operations with Paramesh uh, that we haven't optimized yet. So we are we are looking into that. I think we should be able to improve Paramesh performance there as well. Um, actually, no. The answer is that that includes some number of uh, um, guard cell fills because the, that time includes everything, including tagging and such. So it's not just measuring the update refinement time, it's measuring a whole bunch of other things as well. Yeah, that, that's true as well. We are-, we are so the, the timers are just placed in the wrong place. Yeah. But it, is, in that case, Paramesh was noticeably more expensive, but I thought, I mean, the regridding with Paramesh was supposed to be the faster thing. What do yeah, I no, that, so this is what is the difference between the experiments that Jing Fu ran last year versus what Akash has been doing. I think Jing Fu had the, um, so in terms of what happened last year, it was only at very large uh, node counts that you saw the performance degradation in update refinement in AMRX and the performance right. otherwise was compar uh, comparable between uh, AMRX and Paramesh. So Akash's tests that what he showed today didn't go that far up. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we are gonna. Uh, so I think right right now we are also uh, trying to push this test to a very high limit as well to see what happens. So. The thing is, he's just interested in a different application. You can't make him work with star explosion. He will work with fluid structure interactions, and so he's been doing a different set of <laughs> comparison tests. Right. Right. No, I was just. I was just. I was surprised by that data. Yeah, no. So um, it is true that uh, that 
in our previous uh, runs with the, but but I think we didn't separate out guard cell fill and update refinement there. So it's very much possible that uh, what those uh, experiments showed was just that the at high levels the performance just deteriorated and we maybe I I don't remember all the details, but I do remember that it was pretty flat until you got to something like ten thousand and then it started to move up. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, anything else for Akash right now? Okay, well, thank you again. Um, I believe up next is Axel. Yeah, that sounds great. Let me share the screen. Okay. Shop. That's the show the right screen. Yeah. Cool, nice. Yeah, thank you everyone um, for nice presentation. So far, we will follow up with WAPEX um, and our progress and the current challenges that we are facing. Um, so let's get started. WAPEX is by now more than the few people that you've seen me presenting here or the people at Berkeley Lab, but we have actually a lot of contributors now that use WAPEX in their own applications um, or make it, yeah, or extend to it. By submitting progress, so really happy that based on this, uh, on our ECP work, we can really attract a lot of scientists. And I will show you a couple of, of examples. So we have international contributors from France, for example, from Germany, from CERN. Uh, we even have, have a company that adopts uh, WebEx for their own needs. Um, and of course, we have the core team at Berkeley Lab, both at the ATAP division and here at CRD, um, as well as uh, Livermore and Slab contributions. So let me give you an overview of what is WAPEX, um, what's, what's going on, and then we will go into the software stack parts that we are using and talk a bit about the platform readiness for Exascale. So WAPEX itself is an electromagnetic and electrostatic particle cell code. The most important central one is the electromagnetic pick loop, which we show here and which we also come back during the talk, which is a forward explicitly integrating scheme, and it has these main algorithms to interact between particles and mesh itself consistently. And we have multiple algorithms for each of them that have different properties and that are important for applications. We have advanced algorithms in, uh, in, in BobX, um, such as implementations with co-moving boosted frames and the Lorentz transformed boosted frame. We have like specific solvers um, and better boundaries um, we're working heavily on um, and so on. Then we cover this with multi-physics modules, usually as Monte Carlo modules somewhere here in the pick loop, there are multiple locations where we can integrate them. And they add things that are not solved by Maxwell's equations. So basically like things like atomic physics for feed ionization, Coulomb collisions, um, and QD processes at very strong fields. WAPEX is used in various geometries. So we have uh, four geometries currently implemented um, that are used for various, yeah, various uh, approximations that we can do to simulate faster. And 3D3B is of course the full um, yeah, working horse here. Um, Multi-node polarization, of course, the usual one, MPI. We accelerate um, on GPU and CPU, where we have a detail later on, and we integrate a lot of parallel I.O. and scalable data analysis. I'll also talk a little bit more about parallel I.O. later today um, at a different session where we have a panel about data reduction. What are the applications? Our central application in ECP is laser plasma acceleration. And specifically, what we want to model is the potential future of electron accelerators and colliders, where we have plasma staged accelerators where we accelerate electrons and then later on also positrons um, from one plasma stage to another, which are each of them just a few centimeters instead of miles in conventional accelerators. But if you have a particle cell code that can model this, you can actually model a lot of more things. And there are more applications, for example, at Berkeley Lab, where we also accelerate ions from plasmas. We have also collaborations with Livermore that look in related physics. We even have fusion applications now. Um, then the, the company that I mentioned earlier is looking into thermionic converters. And uh, microelectronics is an active and very successful LDRD with Artemis at, uh, at LBNL. And we have more uh, related fields here. What's new? Well, in the last year, so like 2021, 20, 22, we developed quite a few additional algorithms. Um, each of them are a little bit too much to go into detail, but I will give you quickly an overview. We have one new development here, which is a 
uh, pseudo spectral development um, for fields. So, so usually a traditional now field, we do a finite difference uh, to advanced fields. But we have in our group, we develop a pseudo spectral approach that has way better properties specifically for dispersion and instability control. And the problem usually that we have is that finite differences are usually better staggered and the pseudo spectral one is better in a nodal approach. And what we developed here is a hybrid approach that actually gets the best of both worlds, um, giving it both efficiency and stability of both methods. Um, and it gives us really a uh, real bit of a life speed up for our challenge problem. Other thing that we developed here is um, specifically for the electron accelerators is a new scheme where we can go larger than the CFA criteria uh, for certain aspects of our simulation. And that's highlighted in the following paper. To, oh, I clicked somewhere. <laughs> I opened the paper. That doesn't work. Um, good that it's hyperlinked. Um, then, yeah, then we have specialized algorithms, so electrostatic ones, the quasi electrostatic ones um, that we published recently. And this is the uh, new development with the QED module that I mentioned earlier that we couple, which is not uh, electrodynamics uh, coming in here. The cool part for this one is specifically it's a library that we had initially um, developed to have like kernels that we then ported to C. And now we use this library for these QED modules. And the cool thing about this one is, is that it's portable. And for example, we did experiments both implementing the kernels for the Monte Carlo module here, both in MREX and in COCOS, and have a comparison in this paper for that. Then and an interesting thing with respect to mesh refinement for us is uh, a new development that we just recently put on archive, which um, is a specific boundary condition. And let me motivate you why we why we have to do this 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 uh, boundary condition research. So usually, uh, so the thing is, our when we advance particles and fields in this particle and cell loop, uh, we we basically self uh, we basically update the particles and the fields that they create, including retardation effects. So they only have a finite amount of of influence that it can have per time step. And the problem that occurs here is you have, for example, these uh, bent wave fronts um, of, a, of, a, of a particle that just move relativistically through your plasma, through your domain. Usually what we model is the things inside the simulation domain, but the, uh, we have also challenges that we actually want to get rid of particles. So for example, when we have like low energy particles that we want to get out of the simulation domain, and we want to absorb them, and we have to not only remove the particles, but also somehow get rid of the fields that they generated and carry around. And that's not entirely trivial, and usually creates a lot of radiation when this happens. By coincidence, no, not by coincidence, by design, the uh, our mesh refinement implementation actually needs exactly the same boundary condition because we correct um, for these fields when particles enter from a fine to a coarse pitch. And so what we did here is we extended. Um, an algorithm that is called perfectly matched layers that was used for boundary absorption, usually only for electromagnetic waves, so that it can also account for charges and, um, and absorbs them with a way higher precision than what is yeah, available currently in the community. And so this is one of the key things that we yeah, actively research to get mesh refinement in an electromagnetic uh, particle and cell code to work with as least artifacts as possible. Let me now look a little bit on the software stack and the uh, um, computer science aspects here. So you all know we use AMRX um, as well for WAPX, use for domain decomposition, load balancing, MR data structures. We have the typical data structures on CPU and GPU. We use the parallel force, again, we use primitives with Lambda-based programming to update our and write our kernels. And we uh, use further centrally a couple of features like uh, the parallel linear solvers, for example, for initial conditions or for the electrostatic mode. We solve a Poisson equation. Um, we uh, yeah, work actively on embedded boundaries. Um, and specifically, we need this because when we have party accelerators, we usually have metallic boundaries somewhere. And this is they are relatively close to the beam. Um, and this is specifically interesting if you want to model, for example, a party beam that has like a halo around it and then actually starts to interact with the feeds of that. Um, so yeah, for that we need relatively complicated boundaries, um, and um, yeah, we really have really, can now continue to not only describe them with formulas, but also load the files in the uh, near future. And then yeah, Andrew already mentioned the parser that we are using that was originally for external fields and, and other initialization as well for boundaries that, that can be used on GPU, so the users can provide a function that is already actively used and is now part of MREX, uh, so that you can also use it um, in your codes. How does our general software stack look like? It's actually very complex. Um, we base all everything in the usual HPC things, MPI for multi-load parallelization and then in-node acceleration, um, the, the, the usual. MREX is an essential component for containers, communication, portability, and utilities. We furthermore um, 
pull in uh, math libraries for FFT, usually vendor libraries, and uh, linear algebra routines um, that we need uh, for, for specifically in PSHD. Then a very big stack is also diagnostics. So when we, when we create our uh, when we run our simulations, um, we can easily go 10 to the 11, 10 to the 13 particles if we go at scale. So it means the simulation these days is a petabyte, half a petabyte in output. Um, if you want to have like 10, 12, 15 outputs in a simulation, which is not too much. Um, so we work a lot in making this fast and a lot on reducing this data as well. And for that, we integrate with third parties. So we have a, a metadata standard that I'm leading is called OpenPMD. We integrate this against HDF5 and Audios. And then you do a lot of things like compression um, on the fly or filtering, um, which, is, which is essential for us to get science results out. Then on top of that, we have one of the models that I already showed you. Pixar QED here is the Monte Carlo part. And we have a new library introduced just recently that we're actively pushing which is called a blaster, which is part of sharing the routines that we developed in ECPU for X with the with more plasma and beam modeling software that we have in our our um, in our community. So WarpX is a central routine, and we use this library to share the physics with, for example, the electrostatic implementation that we have with Artemis um, and with new codes like Impact X that are specifically coupling from WarpX then to, to particle accelerators. On top of that, we have one effort, and that could be useful for you as well, which is um, trying to express everything in a scriptable way by exposing all parts that we have through Python. And for that, we started um, the PyEmrix um, library. The PyEmrix library is based on two earlier efforts um, from ExaWind, for example, and from, I think, Steven Brand, right? Um, or I, I think I missed his first name, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, what we do is we expose MREX data structures like multifabs directly, including their memory on GPU directly to the Python layer and can do zero copies between MREX, then WAPX, and any other thing you want to bind to, like Namba and PyTorch, for example. And yeah, that's what we're exposing. And then we build on top of that our object level by, by, uh, bindings for the virtual codes. So it allows us to exchange data between our codes, but also exchange them and keep them on GPU for any other implementation. Um, so that's the repository in GitHub. Check it out if you want to. We have, uh, it's currently mainly explained with tests, not with documentation. Um, the work on this one is ongoing for the next year as well. Um, and I think could be uh, pretty useful for fathers as well. Um, also a uh, plug for that, there will be an other buff on scripting and HPC in a week from now on Thursday in ECP. Um, and we'll talk about this a bit more. So with these object level uh, bindings, we have then our individual codes not only exposed as input files that we can somehow call through an executable, but we can actually script um, the things that we're loading. We can do very complex modifications. Like we have users that come to us and say like, okay, after time to 3000, I would like to make these particles a bit slower and I would like hand pick them. This is something that you don't want to express in an input file. Um, this is something that you really want to expose them to be able to script. And with these Python bindings that can actually also be extended then later on with CUDA code, for example, with number, we actually should be able to um, yeah, provide this not only in a convenient way, but still in a re relatively fast way to hack your own code together without writing um, C++ and recompiling. All right, then platform readiness. So generally you treat platforms like uh, uh, Circle, DPC++, and HIP just like any other platform from the development perspective. They get a part, of, uh, they become part of our CI, we compile them uh, where we can on, on public resources. We make sure that all contributions um, yeah, have to run through that and don't break them so that we don't have forks that, that stale. We have uh, a lot of integration with, uh, integration with uh, installation managers. So for example, Python bindings have pip support, we have spec support, E4S, is integrating that into modules uh, for systems. And we build everything out from macOS, Windows to Linux through CMake so that we don't have uh, yeah, much of a burden there um, and get the support like for threading, for example, on, on Mac and so on. Um, and then yeah, and Python Conda as well. The, um, then let me talk a little bit about a couple of changes that we had specifically like tuning for Frontier um, or for GPUs. So the, the first thing that we had that was a work that we finished last year is we would attribute kernel tuning and we have two central kernels that are taking most of the time. The first one is current deposition when we take particles and deposit back their, their movement to the field, 
which is um, on the right. And then we have another one, which is doing the exact opposite, gathering fields from the grid and putting them on the particle so we can push them around. And what we saw here is that we showed in this paper from Andrew um, is that if we create more locality when we access or scatter, when we get our scatter fields, basically, we can uh, just get a big speed up. Um, and that's the roofline models before and after when we sort particles um, in a closer locality, like by a few cells or by one cell. Um, so that was a great work, and this is like universally useful. This is shown in NVIDIA GPUs from last year, but it's universally useful um, for, for GPUs. We did other optimizations, specifically for AMD um, over the last year, and there was tuning for our pseudo spectral solvers, the FFTs. Uh, so we have sometimes quite some odd numbers. Um, like, for example, we have like powers of 2 plus 16 because we have um, boundaries that we have to communicate. So this is not necessarily the FFT over power of 2 at the end. And so just by talking to the AMD engineers, they, they actually are able to tune these things. So you notice probably from QFFT, they, in the release, they always mention, oh, by now this new number is working faster. And that's exactly what, what was coordinated here as well with AMD by yeah, telling this is our use case and then implementing a, a clever Radix 17 code into ROCKM um, that is now um, just shift, shipped and makes everything faster for us. Then here are some, um, uh, some results that we obtained on Crusher um, or like an MI256. It was actually a pre-Crusher, um, but it's, it's Crusher data. Um, and the, the results that we have here are actually pretty good the, in comparison to theoretical flops that we should get from V100. We'll be comparing half die or one die and the full MI256 in total runtime. And we are pretty, pretty happy with the performance that we get out of here. Nonetheless, um, one thing that we still see is um, that the AMD code for us is generally where, uh, way more yeah, prone to uh, getting performance degradation from register spilling. And that's what we are currently optimizing for our two main kernels. Then I want to show you just one last quick challenge um, that we currently have in local lensing, and it's also on our poster. We have the interesting case that our, when we do local lensing, specifically space filling curves, and we measure the cost that field updates and party updates are totally different costs for us. And uh, that can lead to a problem with load balancing because load balancer might suggest to do something like here on the right hand side for ranks, putting everything that has no particles at all on one rank and then overflowing memory or just getting slower. Um, why does it get slower? Well, because we have to actually synchronize between those points. They are not arbitrarily parallelizable. So classic load balancing where I calculate one cost and then optimize on that for the load balancing doesn't work for us. We actually need to extend them and that's a change that we pose to you if you have something similar, because we need to find a way to optimize them independently so that the overall sum groups between these synchronization points actually gets minimized and not the overall cost of the, of the time step loop. Um, so that's a change that we, yeah, have, that we just try to explore. And if any one of you has seen this before, please reach out. And we, we would like to talk to you. <laughs> and now, last highlight, we last month we ran on all top three machines accounting to HPCG. That means we ran on full scale of Fugaku, Perlmutter, Summit, and a little bit on Crusher. <laughs> um, and these are the scaling results that we got here. So we demonstrated scaling on this for warp X for science case from four to five orders of magnitude. We are very happy with the weak scaling results. Strong scaling, of course, at some point we run out of work. But um, yeah, this is like five orders of magnitude that we could scale. And um, yeah, we're pretty happy with these results. So I'm very happy to share this with you. Um, that we, that we were able to do this. We also compared this to the figure of merit that we use in ECP over time, um, scaled them up to what we could measure. And Fugaku and Summit, for example, they compare as they should. So this is uh, just pretty nice that we get actually CPU and GPU low performance out at the same time in a realistic large scale use case. With that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot, Axel. Let's see, does anyone have any questions for Axel right now? Axel, I have a question. Um, yeah. So the Warp X's team is known for some great pictures, graphics, movies, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about how you're using Ascent and such? Are you doing a lot of stuff uh, in situ now or what's your, What's your workflow look like these days in terms of, of visualizations and also analytics, I guess? Yeah, that's a good question. The, um, there are multiple aspects to that. The, uh, um, we try these days to do as much as possible 
in situ. So basically, uh, it takes us longer to set up our simulations because we try to analyze as much as we can and have the result done when the simulation is done. Um, so we have a lot of things that are called reduced diagnostics, where, for example, measure out beams. Um, and we can, for visualization, we also use Ascent, um, specifically on Summit, um, to get an image out. The challenge is usually with in situ visualization is that we have to somehow know upfront where we're looking for. And this is complicated if we're exploring um, a new science case. So we usually start then with small science cases, like uh, coarse resolution, scale them up, and add more and more. Um, the, uh, but yeah, generally speaking, yeah, we use all these tools at the same time, um, we, uh, um, and they're, they're working pretty pretty decently. So um, we have full visualization we use Ascent on, on Summit uh, with the latest release. We have large scale output where we need it, where we don't yet know what we can filter out and throw away for particles. And there we use Adios um, directly. Um, and then we can also do cost processing, uh, for example, with RFU. Um, and another thing that we actively, uh, that we have new integration since last year, I didn't have time to add this in, is we also have new parallel post processing routines from Jupyter that are similar like to NumPy post processing um, that we did in the OpenPMD data, but they work on Dask. Um, and, it, and they allow us to do basically expressing, oh, I want to do a histogram and a filter and this and that and correlation, um, and then compute this in parallel from Jupyter on a cluster. Um, that's one thing that I'm pretty excited about. Thanks. All right. I, I also see that Bronson has a question about load balancing with the space filling curve in the chat. Oh, let me open that. I'll do. So I, I, I can just read it. So he says, Axel, we have a weighted space filling. We have weighted a space filling curve with a work function, i.e. the cost of nuclear burning in cells to help with load balancing. Is that the kind of modifications for load balancing you referred to? It's actually one step further. We have the same thing. The challenge that we face is um, that we that one cost doesn't cover it. We need basically costs for these individual parts um, and need to balance them individually. Um, or actually need to balance, we need to minimize the sum of these two minimizations. <laughs> um, so we try, can we do exactly what you, what you write in the chat? We do a cost weighted uh, space fairing curve and then cut on the cost count accounts. But that results uh, in, 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 in graphs like this. Yeah. So how we work around this currently is we can use heuristics to, to fiddle with that. So we're able to we're able to work around this. Um, that's that's not a not a super big problem, but I don't want to give this as a general solution to our users. Yeah, we, we've been able to we've we've been able to be pretty effective. The cost the cost can can the cost can differ among cells almost two orders of magnitude. And this has been pretty effective for us. But yeah, having two variables, the minimization gets, uh, the, that optimization problem gets uh, a little bit more complex, I understand. Yeah, we, yeah, we had quite some good success by, uh, by, um, by putting heuristic costs on them that basically incorporate that there's actually memory involved. Um, but yeah, currently it's like, it's like us as power users, we know how to do this, but it would be nice if we can find a general expression for that. Wow. Yes, yes, understood. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's a question from Michael I just saw as well. Uh, you've done something real, similar, but with a different distribution map for burning than the hydro. And I seem to recall it helped a bit. Yeah, yeah, some, yeah something like, like in this direction is what we're, we're thinking. Um, so it occurs to me that the Python bindings you're working on are another avenue that other app, that's another thing that other applications might be interested in taking advantage of. So uh, maybe another topic for like the discussion part of this is, yeah, do you see any use for having that on your application teams? Um, I have a, I have a specific question about the Python bindings too. So I, I know in Warpex, there's the ability to call, to do callback functions. So the user can provide a Python function and then from C++ it's called. And I think it's implemented with C types. Would mm -hmm. you, if you were re-implementing that, would you do it that way again? Or can like PyBind 11 make that easier? 
Yeah, so exactly. So we use PyBind 11 for, for binding, which is a, a pure C++ library. The, uh, there are two, two things. What the most important thing that I want to have is access to all the data directly when we return like a multifab from C++ to Python. And this is what we, this is why we wrap additional classes. Currently, we do all this with, uh, with, with individual C calls into the, the functions. The callbacks that we have on top of that are exactly as you described, like C, like C function stubs. Um, they could actually stay as they are. Um, that's that's not a big deal. They are really just now you can call something. The really important thing for me is like, can I access all the containers and can we just add more of them as we add them in C plus plus and have like one line more in the bindings um, and and yeah, derive properly for example. That, that's the uh, that's the new thing. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, any more questions for Axel? All right, well, thank you very much again. Um, and last for the morning session is Gene Sexton to give us an update on Mix. I, I also want to note we're running ahead of schedule. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, can you all see those slides? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about Nix, Nix's frontier readiness. Um, and I don't have anything specific to say about uh, Aurora read, readiness. Um, so Nix, um, in case you didn't know, is an n body plus hydro uh, cosmology code where the n body is the dark matter particles and the hydro is the baryonic ma matter represented on the mesh, um, massively parallel uh, for fun. Um, so Nix is AMRX based and it uses uh, CVODE, which is part of Sundials for the subgrid ODE solve. And Nix is fully C++ with MPI plus X where um, X could be OpenMP on the host, um, CUDA, HIP or DPC++. Some extensions have actually been MPI plus OpenMP plus CUDA as, um, or using OpenMP with HIP as well. And it's publicly available on GitHub. Uh, the cosmological pro problem of interest in this very wide history of the universe um, is starting in the dark ages where the um, matter is more homogeneous and proceeding forward towards uh, the formation of large scale structure. Um, when we get to a redshift of around two. Um, so our simulations proceed in time in the, and me we measure that time in redshift. Um, so in terms of computational objectives, we want to improve the resolution, resolution of our runs. Um, so for some science cases, that means um, AMR on the density. Um, for the cases that we're considering now, primarily the Lyman alpha case, that just means more particles and more cells for a single level run. Um, but that increase in, in cells and is therefore an increase in data. So we have to balance that increased problem size per GPU with actually having tractable step, step sizes in time. And as we get more and more data, we also want to make sure that we're storing it in a way that we can analyze it and um, use it effectively. Um, yep. So this is this is a flashback to a talk I gave last year. But the important thing to highlight here is in Nix, we might think of the different parts of the physics as um, gravity and particles, so the dark mattery stuff the hydro and um, the heating cooling with other things which also take up time that I'm not going to discuss in this talk. Um, and the heating cooling can include different parts, the things we ship off to CVOD, um, where it's actually their library functions, and uh, the F right hand side, which is really our, our forcing for the ODE, um, which Nix implements itself. Um, this this uh, slide also is a nod to if we use um, OpenMP with CUDA, then we're able to better uh, parallelize um, the 
on the GPU because um, CVOD is driven on the CPU, although the underlying functions do run on the data on the, on the GPU. So going back to the original, um, we have a lot of me memory. How do we sort of handle and track that? So for the mesh, like we can change the number of cells, but we're, we're treating the number of cells as fixed. Um, so if we change the max grid size, that'll affect our number of ghost cells, which affects the memory. Um, generally, for Nix's cases, we force um, the arena to be uh, not managed. So we're going to assume we're using device memory and we're going to make that uh, a consistent assumption with how Sundials is handing the data we hand it. Um, there's a, a couple flags that we've added to adjust how much particle data um, just is allocated uh, extra in case you need it. Maybe we don't actually need extra in case we need it, so then we can shrink sometimes. And we also, similar to um, what Axel was describing with Warpex, have some load balancing that tries to use a heuristic based on the amount of particles per rank um, to better balance that memory in those computations. Um, Nix also uh, has a flag for um, reusing the ML Poisson ob object that we use for the linear solver, um, which if we use one object for the entire thing, um, then it's, you know, we don't have to build the thing again. It's relatively cheap to build. Um, but the, the, some of the caching of the, how well the M MPI communications work um, are better if we just use the same object the whole way through. Um, so that's the memory for where we start from, but um, there's also a bunch of temporary or stretch memory we're using um, similar to um, what Mike was saying with the Hydro and Castro. So Nix has a couple different other flags or things to toggle. Um, there's a minimized memory flag that tries to um, make it so we don't send off too many boxes or tiles to the GPU at once, so we don't run out of memory, essentially. Um, and then th that Hydro tile size also helps us, you know, make sure that we were running a tractable size of problem. Um, so the, the Sundial's tile size is less important for making sure we don't run out of memory. It's, it's more useful for making it so we can run more concurrent uh, CVOD solves. Um, and then that is then also affected by the max number of streams that we tell AMRX to use, which we want to be consistent with OMP thread num if we are using that. Um, the, at the bottom, I have a demonstration of, uh, you know, this square is maybe one box and this square is maybe one box and we're cutting it up into two different tiles. Um, so that's how that's related to these tile sizes, which were given as um, like three integers generally. Um, so for, um, it's a lot of, how do we set up the problem? Well, we do a lot of things to make things run, essentially. Um, but this is a, an example of a 1024 cubed um, run on Crusher with two, um, two Crusher nodes. So looking at how the heating cooling um, is different for different simulation times. So right at the beginning, um, the actual heating cooling part is much less um, and it's decomposed some way. Um, and then later on, the heating cooling takes much more of the run of the overall runtime. And it also um, just in general, a longer amount of time seconds per step. Um, but we don't have to use fun little pie charts. We can also just look at lots of printouts of performance data because the newest version of Sundials has um, 
different ways that you can ask for performance profiling, um, primarily just inclusive performance profiling at the moment. You can also get a lot more statistics logging. So um, hopefully this is something we can exercise in the future to make that 50% of the time in the heating cooling example better. Um, and and the, the main thing, if you actually want to look at these numbers, is we're comparing early time when the ODE solve is not very stiff, stiff, and we only use, say, three nonlinear solve solves. Um, whereas um, I, I picked a really bad uh, tile that was very stiff from the later time results to highlight, and there it's using like 84. Um, of, of that function, and it ends up taking um, about 50 times as long for that much more uh, stiff region. Um, and another thing to um, add to this type of uh, analysis is um, instrumenting NICs with the, the Sundial's uh, performance timers so that we can really see in the same, uh, see in, in their list of timers where our F right hand side is um, compared to just, this is how many times we call a certain sundials function. Um, so then back to the hydro or back to overall tiling effects. Um, so for sundials, we're, we're trading off concurrency um, by making the tiling smaller um, so we can get those really stiff cells to be separate and you know not make everything uh, slower sort of as a tent pole problem um, and the hydro tiling as i mentioned earlier we primarily see as a way to control how much memory we're using um, and so these two plots are the same data. Um, the, they're replotted to show um, on the bottom, it's by the number of nodes of pressure that were used for the run. Um, the, the orange line is a, if this scaled perfectly, this is what we would see. So that's a demonstration. We w only went up to 64 nodes for this test. Um, and this, the blue and, and red are for two times 256 cubed cells per rank. And then the green is double that. So like four times 256 cubed cells per rank. Um, so the, um, this was good that we could run with twice as many cells on um, the same number of nodes. Um, but for, um, the the red one is with tiling off for sundials and for the hydro um and the blue one is with the tiling on there's not um a twice as much data without tiling uh line because that uh failed due to running out of memory. allocate our memory and set things up is important for nix at certain um, gene your sound it. cut out for a minute there you might need to repeat the last point you made uh okay <laughs> sorry um so the uh these plots have four lines the two ones on the bottom are faster with half as much data the one on the top is slower with um more data Gene, are you there? I think we're having some sound issues. I think maybe the screen froze. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe, Gene, if you can hear this, you might need to try uh, leaving and then joining the meeting again. Um, <laughs> Like maybe there she goes. Um, 
So while we're waiting on that, I had another, there was a, something I wanted to ask after Axel's Warpex talk that I forgot, but so he showed plots where he showed that um, sorting the particles periodically can make a significant difference in terms of the time for particle mesh operations. So a question is, are there other AMRX applications where those operations are significant and are they try, have they tried to do this already? So I don't know if, for example, in MFIX, you ever see the actual particle mesh deposition or interpolation times being significant, but if so, have you tried to do the, the sorting? So I can speak to that a little bit. Um... In most of our cases, the fluid solve and, and part of work is, is far more expensive than the mesh operations, but we are starting to see those mesh operations becoming more and more expensive as, as we move to some of these different hardware uh, architectures. Um, we have, or I should say, a, a program off of ours uh, had investigated different sorting techniques in the past and saw uh, some performance gain, both in particle mesh operations, but they were also sorting with respect to locality of other particles to improve particle-particle uh, -particle collision detection as well. I see. Okay. Well, it's something. So I, I think to to try to implement this, I think you basically need to just insert a few calls to AMRX functions. Um, and so it's easy to try if anyone is seeing if anyone's seeing those particle mesh operations being expensive in their application. I think there's an easy thing to try to see if it if it helps. Um, so it's still waiting for Jean to come back. Um, I'm, I'm not oh. sure if my internet is, is stable. I can, I can try again. Um, we'll require careful analytics, which aren't, um, you know, necessarily something we can set at the beginning and keep using having some sort of tuning would likely be better. Um, so thanks. Um, any All right, thank questions? you, Jean, and thank you for persevering through the through the technical difficulties. I know that's unnerving. Um, let's see, does anyone have any questions for Jean right now? So I think we should just point out that the the uh, the artwork on the side of Perlmutter is in fact a result of a Nick simulation. As she's got a partial of there. <laughs> Just worth saying. Um, Carol, has so, hand, Carol has her hand up. Oh, would you like to ask a question, Carol? No, I meant to be clapping, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I had a question. So I, I think I understood you saying that you see a benefit from using OpenMP and CUDA at the same time, uh, specifically mm -hmm. for the reaction network in Nix. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And so has does Castro do the same thing or have they seen that? Have they tried to do that? Uh, so the the benefit I'm I'm seeing is I, I think related to how um, how this this streams are related to um, the particular ODE solver used in that case. I, I'm not sure it's making a difference in terms of like the reaction itself. Um, but Mike can. Uh, we have we haven't used OpenMP and CUDA together. If that if that was the question, um, and yeah, our reaction. We're not using CVOD. We're using our VOD that we uh, changed ourselves, and um, and it's all on the GPU instead of being managed by the host. So I think it's just very different. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That was yeah. That was my question. Yeah. All right. Any other questions uh, about Nix for Jean? Okay, if not, um, I want to thank all of the speakers again for uh, a nice set of presentations. I also want to thank uh, everyone who came and attended the session. 
Um, another thing I want to point out is that so a lot of AMRX development and discussion takes place on our Slack channel. And I think a lot of the people on this are already part of that. But if anyone is not and wants to be invited to our Slack channel, if they have ideas they want to discuss, uh, please message me. Uh, you can do it through the Whova app, I think, for the, that the meeting's using. And just send me your email, and I'll add you to our, uh, to our Slack channel. Just a technicality, there's a whole AMRX Slack workspace with multiple channels. Uh, yes, yes, workspace, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, well, then I guess there's nothing else for the morning session of this. So uh, we reconvene at 4 um, Eastern, 1 Pacific, where we'll hear three more talks, and then we'll have some time set aside for discussion. So. Thanks everyone again for attending and I'll see you uh, see you later on.